And we'll start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. When we read one verse out of this chapter to start, I'm interested in the last verse of the chapter, verse number 40. The Bible says, Let all things be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do bless you. Thank you for the good singing. I'm glad the blood of Calvary has made us free indeed. And Lord, I'm thankful that once the blood has been applied, things are different now. I'm glad that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new because of the newness of life. And Lord, we thank you for your good grace. Now, Lord, thank you for this number tonight. I pray for those again that are sick. Pray for Miss Debbie in the hospital and Miss Carol. They rushed to the hospital today. I pray for others that are sick. You touch them. Lord, we're thankful for the prayers you have heard and answered. Lord, I do pray for that little boy named Jackson who has cancer and the cancer is growing. I pray for him and his family that, Lord, you'd help them. Lord, I pray during this holiday season when there are some who are less fortunate, God, you would bless them and help them. I certainly pray we'd be able to reach many for Christ um, because we do know that your imminent return is at hand. Now, Father, bless, bless us tonight. Help us enlighten our minds, instruct us in the ways of righteousness. Help us, Lord, to embrace your truth. Help us to be edified. Help us, Lord, to certainly be strengthened in our inner man. Help us, Lord, to be able to, having done all to do, that we can do, stand and stand therefore. Because, Lord, the time is coming and is now upon us where if you're going to live by this Bible, you're going to have to make some stands. So, God, give us the faith, give us the strength, and give us certainly uh, the foundation that it will take to stand for the Lord Jesus who bled and died for us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. Help us now. In Jesus' name, we do ask these things and pray. Amen and amen. Uh, throughout this study, we've looked at several things. We've looked at the origin of the church. Uh, very important. Church didn't start at Pentecost like some teach. Uh, we've looked at the ordinances of the church. We've looked at the officers of the church. Uh, we've looked at uh, the offerings of the church. That was a real positive message. huh? Everybody loves that message. Uh, and then we looked at the objective of the church. And the objective is always to uh, see people saved. And so uh, we're certainly appreciative of those uh, studies. Tonight, as we read in verse number 40, the Bible says, Let all things be done decently and in order. And tonight, we're going to look at order in the church. Order in the church. Uh, the definition of order is this. Regular disposition or methodical arrangement of things. Means extensive application. Means proper state. Means adherence to the point in discussion according to established rules. It means established mode of proceeding. It means a settled mode of operation. It means a mandate, a precept, a command, or authoritative direction. Spiritual order is accomplished through awareness and obedience. Let me say that again. The Holy Ghost gave me that. Spiritual order is accomplished through awareness and obedience. When you are aware of what the rules and what the commands and what the process is, then you are required to be obedient to them. And spiritual order is all about awareness and obedience. The reason we've been in this mode of study on Baptist distinctives is so that you would know what we believe. You would know what the Bible stands for, and the Bible's what makes us Baptists. And uh, being aware of that, then you have the choice to be obedient and be faithful to the things of God. Uh, now take your Bibles and go with me over there in Leviticus chapter number 10. Now keep in mind uh, the methodical arrangement of things. Keep in mind the establishment of rules, the established mode of proceeding, a settled mode of operation, a mandate, a precept, a command, authoritative direction. Keep that in mind. In Leviticus chapter number 10, look with me in verse number 1. 
the Bible says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Again in verse number 1, it says, The sons of Aaron took his censer. They took Aaron's censer. Aaron was the anointed high priest of Israel. These two young men had no business touching something that God had deemed holy and something uh, that was not committed to them. As a result, the Bible says they offered up strange fire before the Lord and that fire consumed them. Now, can I say there's a lot of so-called churches tonight offering up strange fire to the Lord. The Lord has not commanded it. The Lord has not sanctioned it. The Lord is not requesting it. Uh, they are doing that to gratify their own flesh. Uh, and my dear friends, those very things they're trusting in will consume them. Now look on down in verse number 8 of Leviticus chapter number 10. And the Lord spake unto Aaron. Now keep in mind, Aaron's the high priest. He just had two boys consumed by God. Now look at what God tells him. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. Now earlier, and we didn't read it, but God told Aaron not to even mourn over his sons. Now when somebody does so wickedly that it, that it displeases God, that God tells you not to even mourn over them. And then God gives Aaron some clarification. He says, now, don't drink any wine or any strong drink. When you or your sons, those that will follow your lineage, when you go into the, uh, uh, the temple of the Lord, he said, uh, so that you can show there's a difference between holy and unholy, what's profane and what's un uh, you know, unprofane, uh, and that you may be able to teach the generations to come the very law that God gave Moses. You see, my dear friends, God's always had a divine order. God has a divine order for the home. The man is the head of the household. The wife uh, is to be the head of uh, 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 the home is her domain. She's to take care of the home, but she's to submit to her husband the head. The children are to be obedient to the parents. And as long as each of them are in their roles, God will bless the home. But you get the woman wearing the pants telling the man what to do and the house is going to be a, a, a house that is not in tune with God and God will not bless the home. You get to where most in this day and age where the children tell the parents what to do. Uh, 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 can I tell you, there'll be chaos in the home and God will not bless the home. My three children are right here. You, you ask them after service how many times they told me and Miss Annette what we was going to do in our household. Mm -hmm. They still don't do that. They're all grown. Why? Because we taught them. We try to live biblically. And can I say, when you do, God blesses. God has a divine order for the home. God has a divine order for society. If society puts God first and seeks God and hungers after God, God will bless the nation. When righteousness is exalted, God blesses the nation. When wickedness is exalted, uh, judgment comes, my dear friends. Can I say, God's got a divine order for the church. Jesus is the head of the church, the under-shepherd, the man of God, the pastors, the under-shepherd. Uh, he's below the Lord Jesus, obviously. He gets direction from the Lord Jesus. Uh, and as we taught, there are officers, uh, there are lay people in the church, and as long as the man of God follows God and the people of God follow the man of God, God will bless. Uh, but you start doing things out of order, or you start doing things that displeases God or goes against the Word of God, and God brings judgment on the church. Now I want to look at some of that tonight. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. In the divine order of the church, 
Can I say there is a divine order for the practice of worship? There are some so-called churches where their services are nothing more than a free-for-all. I mean, I, I mean, it's just like Phil back when you was a kid and you watched a, a, a big-time wrestling, you know, and they just tagging in and out and doing all that crazy stuff, you know. That's what some churches are. It's just absolute chaos. And they think it honors God. There are some churches that do everything out of ritual, and they think that honors God. There is a divine order in our worship and in the practice of worship. Look again in First Corinthians chapter 14. We'll just pick up verse 23, and I'll make some comments on what happens in the beginning of the chapter. The Bible says, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? The Bible says in verse 24, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one that uh, unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, uh, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. We dealt with that a couple weeks ago. Now look at verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion but of, of peace, as in all the churches uh, of the saints. Uh, goes on to say, let your women be silent in the churches. Uh-oh, we're going to get really good tonight. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. All right, that was a whole mouthful, but let me cover some things that Paul was dealing with in the church at Corinth. Can I say the church at Corinth was a carnal church? Uh, we have children here tonight, but I will tell you one of the things this church was guilty of is that they would uh, swap wives and have relations in the church. There was one uh, a, a young man having relations with his stepmother in the church. I mean, all kinds of wickedness going on, and nobody would uh, say anything about it. So this letter is really rebuking them concerning the way that they should conduct themselves and concerning worship. Why anybody would call themselves Corinth Baptist Church, I have no idea. They certainly aren't Bible believers. Hmm? That would be a disgrace. That'd be almost as bad as calling yourself a Democrat. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Um, but let me share with some things. They was having some real problems. Now you've got to understand that the early church, the apostles, had special gifts. And God gave gifts to men. And those gifts uh, were assigned to the Jews that the Messiah had come and that God was doing a work in the Gentile people. Now, the Jews uh, always required a sign. The Greeks sought after wisdom. So we find here that this church at Corinth... Uh, was a free-for-all church. And one thing they did is they, they all liked to speak in tongues. Now let me just help you right here get this nailed down. The word tongues simply means language. So what Paul was saying, and he said it earlier in the chapter, that if everybody come in was speaking in tongues, uh, and somebody came in and didn't speak that language... He'd think he's all a bunch of barbarians. Yep. Let's put that in perspective. Let's say we come in and Brother Clint gets up and he, he gives a message 
in Latin. And then Brother Phil gets up, and he gives a message in Hebrew. Wouldn't that be a sight? Huh? And then Brother James gets up, and Brother James, he speaks Greek. And then uh, uh, a Christian gets up, and Christian speaks in Old Syriac. And the rest of us speak English, and we don't have any idea what they're saying. Paul instructs them that if somebody speaks in a tongue other than what most people in the congregation speak, there has to be an interpreter. Now, we have in our church witnessed New Testament tongues. We've had missionaries come through from Mexico who didn't speak real uh, plain English, and we'd have an interpreter where he would speak and stop, and the interpreter would tell us what he said, and the church was edified. If the missionary would have just kept speaking, we'd have had no idea. What it was. It's kind of like when you call a, a, a customer service somewhere, and you call and you want to you know, find out why your TV isn't working, and you get somebody on the line, you say, uh, where are you from, Pakistan? Can I speak to somebody from, from America, please? Huh? Because you don't understand them. Well, that's what was going on in this church. So the apostle deals with tongues. He deals with revelations. There'd be people come in and say, well, God spoke to me and this is what's going to happen. Now, the Bible makes it clear that if there was a prophet from God, you knew he was a prophet because everything he prophesied came to pass. Everything. But then somebody would have revelations. He said everyone would want to sing a song. Can you imagine? We've got 200, 250 people in the building. Every one of them's going to sing a special. Uh, everybody would be ready, to, ready for preaching when that was all done, wouldn't they? I won't mention the church and I won't mention the preacher, but I once went to hear a preacher and went to preach for a church who needed a pastor and they wanted him to come and try out, so I went to support him. I liked the guy. And I'm there to support him and I'm not exaggerating. That church sang 11 songs before he got up to preach. It was dead in a hammer. I mean, after, after four or five, it was time to preach and they just kept singing and kept singing. They sang it to death. And then they called on him to preach. And what, what the joker do? He reached out and said, Hey, Brother Doug, why don't you pray for us? Oh, yeah, let me resurrect this thing. What a blessing, huh? But he did preach. He'd done a good job. They didn't want him as their pastor because he was pretty pointing what he had to say. But anyway, Paul's dealing with that. Now, let me deal with something real quick here. Look in chapter 13. Look in verse 8. Need to underscore this. The Bible says, charity never faileth. In other words, you never do wrong loving on people and being good to people. Now look what else he says. Now there's a colon in there. And he says, but whether they be prophecy, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Look at verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And you see that? Now, those that belong to chaotic churches, that they believe in speaking in tongues, which in their mind it's just a bunch of jibber-jabber, they all say the same thing. See my bow tie, see my bow tie, see my bow tie. Shumba, that's what they say. And they'll tell you that was of God. And God wasn't in a million miles of it because it wasn't a language. And see, when Paul wrote in chapter 14, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, they say that's what we're doing, we're speaking in an unknown tongue. Paul's talking about if the language is not known by anybody in the congregation. But just to put it all to rest, Paul wrote in chapter 13, charity never fails. From the early church to right now, charity is a good thing. It's still prevalent, and it's good to love people, and it's good to be good to people, and you just might win somebody doing so. But he says whether there be prophecies, they're going to fail. And can I say, there are no more prophets. If somebody stands up and tells you they're a prophet, you mark that joker, he's crazy. There's no prophets. The Bible goes on to say that the Scriptures are not of any private interpretation. God doesn't give somebody a special revelation. 
He says, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. You see, one of the miracles of the day of Pentecost is that uh, when the Holy Ghost fell on that early church and Peter got up to preach, there were people from every nationality there at Jerusalem because of the feast. Uh, and Peter got up to preach. He preached in his language. Uh, but the miracle was every man there heard in his own language. Can I say it was a great miracle? And in the early church, God would give someone the gift of speaking a language they didn't know. If they was in a congregation of a bunch of, uh, let's say Brother Ted was here uh, 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 on Sunday night, a bunch of gypsies, and they speak a gypsy language, but you didn't speak it, but God could pour out on you, uh, 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 my dear friends, the ability to preach in your language, but they hear it in their language. It's a miracle. But here Paul said, tongues shall cease. And what did he qualify it with? When that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away. Now those that are chaotic churches, crazy churches, charismatic churches, they'll say, well, the only one perfect is Jesus, and he hadn't come, so we can still do all this mess. What he's talking about, when that which is perfect shall come, he's talking about the completed word of God. They didn't have that. And the Apostle Paul was just being inspired to pin it down. But you see, we have it. He said, for we uh, know in part, we prophesy in part. But you and I have the whole counsel of the Word of God. I don't need somebody to come in and give me a revelation. I've got the revelation right here. Mm, so when the last apostle died, so did all the apostolic gifts. When John died, that was the end of it. And can I say... Uh, nobody spoke in tongues in America until 1901, and that was the first year a false Bible was printed in America. And there, there are a lot of folks that claim that they got the Holy Ghost, and they're blaming it all on the Holy Ghost. Now, let me qualify something. There is a spirit behind it, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Hmm? And when Paul said that uh, uh, folks come in, they'll think you're all mad. I've been in some, some places where folks are doing that, and they're a bunch of crazy people, I'm telling you. No? Huh? They are. I have a preacher friend of mine. He was having a service, and there was somebody there stood up, spoke in tongues, and he, and he rebuked him and said, hey, we don't do that around here. And he was very very cordial. He's a lot better than me. Uh, so we don't do that around here. Appreciate it if you don't do that. And it was having a singing. Somebody, the singer got singing. They jumped up and did it again. He said, okay, I'm going to interpret what he said. Because the Bible goes on here in this chapter, say if somebody speaks in tongues, there has to be an interpreter. He said, I'm going to interpret what he said. He said, y'all bow your heads. He said, they just said they're going to give $5,000 to the building fund. Everybody lift up their heads, that crowd was gone. True. True story. So we see that there was no order. They were wanting, everybody wanted to sing. Everybody wanted to prophesy. Everyone wanted to speak in tongues. Everyone wanted to do all this stuff. And Paul went on and said, speaking in tongues and all that stuff, that's not the important thing. He said the important thing is prophesying, or what we would know today as preaching the Word of God. That's the good part. That's what you ought to long for is the preaching. And so we see that in the practice of worship, not everybody can sing. It's not God's will when we have, you know, when I ask if somebody wants to brag on Jesus or not, but God's will for everybody to testify. Now, if you're saved, you could easily raise your hand and say, I don't want to thank God for saving me. But you don't feel led to when we do that every time we do. Now, I'm going to tell you, there are some people, if I give an opportunity to testify, they're going to testify or die. That's not the will of God. That's why I've tried to teach you how to discern the Holy Spirit, whether or not the Holy Spirit wants you to know you say, well, I don't know. Then keep your mouth shut. Because when he's a blood on the inside, you'll know. Mm. But there's some, they're going to they're gonna say something or die, and nine times out of ten, it kills the service. Because they're doing it in the flesh. They're not being led of the Spirit. Mm. And can I say, we got a lot of talent in our church. we got a lot of folks that can sing specials. But it's not God's will for them all to sing all the time. Hmm? That's why I try to pray and try to seek the mind of God. And a lot of times I'm sitting over there while the choir singing, saying, God, who do you want to sing? Uh, I, want, I want to make certain we're following the, the Lord uh, because there is an order. 
and you know our rule we mind the Lord around here there's something else that he addressed in this when we get to the practice of worship in the order he deals with women in the church and he says that women need to be silent in the church he said now if a woman has a question she needs to wait till she gets home and ask her husband about it. now let me qualify this right now the apostle is not discriminating against women He's not a chauvinist. He's not a pig. Nope. You've got to understand under the law, the women weren't allowed in the temple with the men. They, they could be in the rotunda up around the top, but they could not be in what we would call the sanctuary with the men. They weren't privileged to that access. And you've got to also understand that in the synagogues, they would come in, and a lot of times they would read a verse, and then they'd start having an open debate and question what, what's this verse mean and what does it say and then when the early church came together and the apostle would preach he'd have to break it way down and explain it to them and they'd start asking questions uh, what about this and what about that and what Paul is saying is women need to be silent in the church uh, and if she's got a question she has no place to do it inside the sanctuary ask her husband at home he was not excluding women from the church. He was actually including them. They weren't allowed in the sanctuary before the church. Now, what's he dealing with when he's dealing with women should be silent in the church? Well, in another place he wrote that women should not usurp authority over the man. That's very important. Nowhere and in no way is it biblical for a woman to get up and teach men in the, in the church. It's not her place. Another thing, you see a, a facility calls itself a church, and the husband's the pastor and the wife's the co-pastor, run. Women are not to teach or preach behind the sacred desk of God. Men's in the, in the sanctuary. They're not to. They're to be silent. Uh, that's very important. Now, doesn't mean women can't preach. They're probably preaching their husband all the way to church and all the way home. But they aren't allowed to preach in the sanctuary, okay? Uh, now, let me qualify this. Whenever it's dealing with women being silent, it's talking about usurping authority over the man. Now, does not mean a woman can't sing in church. Now, if we if we want to bastardize that verse and be like some Pharisee Baptist, Baptist we wouldn't let her sing hmm? you, you know that verse about swallowing camels and straining at gnats there's a lot of jokers do that I can go dra drag out about six verses right now under the law that they'll, they'll adhere to uh, and, and they've lost their mind uh, a woman can sing in church She's not usurping authority over the man. She's using her talent, and, and she's bringing glory to God. Can I say this? We have testimony time. It's okay for a woman to testify. Her testimony is what God's done for her. Her testimony, I couldn't give my wife's testimony. Now, I know some Pharisee Baptist churches where she's supposed to whisper in her husband's ear, and he's supposed to stand up and tell what his wife just told her. Well, if he's like most men, he don't listen to about half of what she says in the first place. So she's not going to get it. He's not going to get it all straight, and then she's going to preach to him all the way home. She is not usurping authority over the man when she is giving her testimony about what God's done for her. When we have open prayer requests, a woman can give a prayer request. She's not usurping authority over the man. It's dealing with teaching or preaching or being in some authoritative role where she has power over the man. She's to be silent in the church. Okay. So we see that he deals with the order, divine order of church. Now some churches have got it so so organized and so much order that uh, you, they're going to come in, they're going to sing two congregational songs, they're going to call on within five men who to pray, and they're going to pray, and they prayed so much, you know exactly what they're going to say, and then they're going to, uh, uh, take up an offering and somebody's going to pray over that and then they're going to uh, have a special 
then the preacher's going to get up and he's going to preach and he's going to have five points, going to have a couple sub points, going to throw in a poem, then they're going to have an invitation, they're going to sing two verses of Just As I Am, if nobody comes or if everybody comes, two verses all you're going to get, and at noon they're at Cracker Barrel. Because they got it real organized. It's real decent and in order. The problem with that is they don't give any room for the Holy Ghost to move. You always got to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. What can I say? Sometimes he leads in the song service, and it might require another song and another song. Sometimes he might blow through and a testimony service breaks out. Sometimes he might blow through on the preacher, and the preacher ended up preaching something he hadn't even been planning on preaching. Uh, so you've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I, I worry about these churches that two weeks ahead of time you can go see on the marquee what the preacher is going to be preaching on on Sunday morning. There have been times that I've stayed up all night, put the final dot on my outline about 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, get ready to head to bed, and the Holy Ghost say, no, that's not it, and go right back to it and just end up taking a shower and come to church. Now, it's been a while since that's happened, but I want to tell you something. I'd rather know what the Holy Ghost wants than to do something I want. That's why I labored so long on this study and making sure it was the will of God because I, I, I'm not good with studies. You know, I want, I'm, I'm ready to preach whatever God shows me. I, was, I saw something today. And I told Miss Ned on my church. I said, boy, boy, I've seen a good thought. I might have to preach it Sunday. Um, so you've got to do things in order, and the order is dictated by the Holy Ghost and by the Word of God. Okay? And can I say, the Holy Ghost gives the pastor discernment. That's why sometimes somebody will raise their hand to say something I won't call on, because it's not time to, for that. It's time for preaching. And we've learned people have gotten a lot better of it when it's testimony service. That's not time to give prayer requests. And when it's prayer requests, that's not time for testimonies. You've got to do things in decent and in order and follow the direction and, the, and, and follow the command and follow the mode of what God is doing. There is an order for the practice of worship in the church. There's also order for parliamentary procedure in the church. When we have a business meeting, the first thing we do is we call the church to order. We open with prayer. We ask God's blessing on the business meeting. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the pastor is the one that will run the business meeting. Can I say, when we're in a position of business, once again, women are to be silent in the church. Now, over the years, there's been some women who have a hard time with that. There's been women that ran businesses and had a hard time with they couldn't give their input in a business meeting. Sorry. And some of them, their husbands didn't come to church. And so I'd say, well, if you've got a question or any problems or anything, see the deacons. Let them know your concerns. And... Uh, that, but women can't speak up in the business meeting. Women can't second a motion. They can't make a motion because that would be usurping authority over the man. There's a parliamentary procedure. Anything brought before the church, it has to have a motion, has to be discussed, has to have a second where the motion is seconded, and then it has to go to a vote. And then women are allowed to vote if they're a member of the church but can I say, then it goes majority rules. There is a parliamentary procedure when it comes to business in the church. Now, a lot of times we get so used to come to church, come to worship, come to sing, come to enjoy the things of God. We don't realize a lot of times the church is a twofold constitution. And we recognize the worship side. There's also a business side. And it's very important to understand there's a business side. And when the state looks at the church, and that's why the goofy governor we got doesn't understand what's going on. They look at the church as a non-profit corporation. They look at the church as a business because they don't have the spiritual eyes like God looks at it as a place of worship. But it is God's government on earth. And there is a business side. And so there is parliamentary procedure. But also in the order of the church, there's professionalism. Uh, can I say the church needs to have a good name in the community? And especially in the business side. The church ought to pay our bills. The church ought to have good standing at the bank. The church ought to have good standing in the community. 
uh, church ought to have a good standing with the law enforcement uh, uh, association. Uh, I know some churches, the law association knew them real good because they was there breaking up business meetings all the time. That's a bad name on the church. The church ought to have a good name. I can name names. Brother James, I can tell you right now, church, that every business meeting the law was called. That ain't Christian. That's not what God ordained. But there ought to be a sense of professionalism in the church. You ought to treat people with respect. You ought to be respectable. But when it comes to the church and how people look at the church, can I say the church ought to be beautiful? It ought to be clean. The church ought to be as nice as any home anybody lives in. I've seen churches where you go in, the songbook racks are tore off of the back of the, uh, of the pew and nobody put them back on, just laying there on the floor. I went to churches where you couldn't find any light switch covers on the lights. You go in and be a mess, filthy. And they just treated it like it was just second thought in their mind. God's house ought to always look great. It ought to be inviting and welcoming. And Brother Charlie Miller's in heaven. I'll never forget what he, something he said to me going on 25 years ago. He said, Brother Doug, you need to make the church shiny for the sinners. Because if they come in and they can find any area to find fault, they won't listen to the message. We ought to give sinners no excuse to not listen and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be warm. We ought to be welcoming. We ought to be real. But the house of God ought to be professional. It ought to be first class. Listen, if you've ever been around me, you know what I think of the church. The church needs to be first class. I haven't had to do it in a while, but there was a while, you know, people, anything they cleaned out of their garage, they'd come just leave it here at the church. Church isn't a place for your junk. Uh, there's a place called the garbage can for that stuff. they just bring it out and drop it and say, well, I thought somebody might need that. Well, take it to them then. Don't bring it to the church. I once had somebody ask me, preacher, can we have a yard sale? No. A lot of people, you know, buy a lot of stuff at yard sales, and we give all the money to the church. No, nope. the church is be funded by the tithes and offerings of God's people. So we're not going to have a bunch of junk out in the front yard of the church, and people drive by and say, look at that poor church. They can't even afford to pay the bills. they got to sell all their junk to pay the bills. God's not honored in that. And then I told them, I said, if you're so concerned about it, why don't you sell your junk in your, in your driveway and then bring all the profits and put it in the church? That never happened one time. The church ought to be professional, first class. Ought to be something you're proud of. I'm proud to tell folks I'm a member of Emanuel Baptist Church. Uh, I told a guy the other day, business, uh, tire store. I told my pastor of church, he said, where? I told him, he said, I know where that's at. I'm glad I didn't have to say, Emanuel Baptist Church. So we see there is an order to the church. There's a reason we do things the way we do around here. So I hope you understand that. Well, let me give you this tonight, and we'll be done. What is our obligation to the church? We've seen a lot of these aspects about the church, but as members of this local assembly, what's our obligation to this church? There are some people, they love the church. There are some people who make a stand for the church. There are some people, I'd say, they'd be willing to take a hit for the church. There are some that'd be willing to go to jail for the church. I believe that. But then there's a whole lot of people. Well... Brother James, I was talking before church. Well, the Bible says, render unto Caesar what Caesar is unto God, what's God. So if the government says do this, we better do what the government says. I'd rather do what God says. Hmm? Uh, but there's some people, they just don't care about the church as much as others. 
You can, you can call for a work day and you can see who loves the church. They'll come out and work. We have a special day and a meal. You can see who loves the church. They're making sure things get cleaned up, look good. You can watch when somebody drops a piece of paper on, on the floor who loves the church. They'll go pick it up and put it in a garbage can. You can tell who loves the church. They'll go over and welcome people to it. They're proud of it. But what is our obligation? What does God expect from members of His church? I mean, we love talking about we're saved by grace. We love talking about the mercy of God and the loving kindness of God, the tender mercy of God. We love the blessings of God, the benefits of God. Oh, we love all that stuff. That all comes from God. What does God expect from us? You were bought with a price. I, I hate the terminology, salvation's free. No, it wasn't. It cost heaven all that heaven had. God bankrupt heaven with His only begotten Son to pay for your sin and my sin. It wasn't free. Oh, we didn't have to pay for it because we couldn't. But we were paid for. And God expects a return on His investment. So what is our obligation to the church? Can I say members of a local New Testament church have a responsibility and are obligated, first of all, to pray. We're commanded to pray. We're commanded to pray without ceasing. We're commanded to bring supplication before the Lord. We're commanded to intercede on behalf of others before the Lord. We are commanded to pray. We are obligated to pray. Prayer is where the power of God comes from. Prayer is where discernment comes from. Prayer is where intimacy with God comes from. I read something today. I thought it was quite telling. It said that God doesn't even listen to a lot of people's prayers because there is no passion from their heart when they're praying them. They're just going through the motions. He don't even have time for them. We're obligated to pray, which means to take time and as Jesus gave the example when he taught on it, get to a prayer closet, get to where you can get put everything else out of your mind and out of your life and spend some time with just you and God. Some of the best prayer meetings I've ever had is behind the wheel of a car. I don't know how I get to where I get, but I get there. But I've had a good time talking with God. One time I got to talking with the Lord and looked up and I'm crossing the Tennessee border. I thought, Lord, I don't know how I got here, but I'm here. Thankfully, I was headed that way. Hmm? I'm here to tell you, we are obligated to pray. How much do you pray for the church? How much do you pray for the man of God to, to hear from heaven? How much do you pray for sinners to get saved? How much do you pray for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that God would bless them and God would help them? And uh, the folks that are sick, how much do you pray for them? See, our prayer lives speak a lot about our Christianity. It also speaks about how much we care about the church. If we was really honest, and God put on the screen about our prayer lives, number one, we'd find out we don't pray very much. And most of the time, our prayer life is selfish. God help us to study to pray. Brother Wheeler sent me a video that he put together, and we're going to show it here in the church. Everybody gets back. He did a great job on it. Uh, Y'all remember when Brother Greg Phillips was here in camp meeting a few, few years ago, and he preached on the curse of modern technology? You know, we had more negative feedback from that one message than all the other messages we've ever preached around here combined. And we did. People hated that message. It was a good message. But they twisted it like they twist everything. You know, all those liberals always twist things. Uh, but Brother Wheeler took a portion of that message and he put together a video and he brought out some statistics, you know, and he's got, you know, Tucker Carlson, a bunch of people talking about st some statistics. And it was excellent. It was wonderful. But in that, I realized why so, much, so many people spend so much time on social media. If we could get people to turn off their phones half the time that they use them, 
and commit that time to praying, our churches would be totally different. We're obligated to pray. We're obligated to pursue holiness. The Lord said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, if we're honest, we don't have much holiness about us. We're, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, the Apostle Paul had to die out to sin three times a day. If he, di- or he had to die out daily. If he had to die out daily, how many times do we need to die out? But what I'm trying to say is we are to pursue holiness. And the Bible says, Seek and ye shall find. How much do you pursue holiness? How much do you ask God to strip you of your humanity? and replace it with His holiness. We're to pursue that. We're obligated to pursue holiness. How can we be the light to this dark world when we can't even muster a flicker? See, you only shine as bright as you are as close to God. He's the light. The closer you get to Him, the brighter you're going to shine. And when you're pursuing Him and His holiness in your life, you'll shine bright. When was the last time somebody put a, put a garment over your face because you were shining too much? Or they're trying to put one over your mouth and nose because you breathe too much. They're trying to kill you. Huh? We're obligated to pray. We're obligated to pursue holiness. We're obligated to practice Christian love. Jesus said, this is how the world will know you, that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. Then say they'll know you're my disciples because of the buildings you build, or because of the money you give to missions, or because of all the good deeds you do. No, they'll know because of your love. You know one of the things I'm proud of our church? We have a loving church. Folks, there's love one another around here. That's a blessing. How, How do we practice Christian love? Through charity being good all them gifts we gave for those foster kids I mean those kids are going to have a good Christmas that that thrills me the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive and when you're charitable you're practicing Christian love and through forgiveness when you have a forgiving spirit when somebody stands up and confesses they've lived like the devil you ought to forgive because you probably lived like the devil a time or two in your life and if you don't forgive them how would you expect God to forgive you Uh, you practice Christian love by edifying people by building them up by encouraging them by helping them in some circles the mentality of Christian people is to beat people down that's not biblical we're to build people up we're to help them we're to be good to them bear their load just uh, try and restore them back to the good things of God can I say we're also I'll practice Christian love through comforting folks. Some folks are hurting. And you can show them and be Christ-like just comforting. Sometimes just being there and just for them to have somebody to listen to them is so comforting. Sometimes you might have to pray with them. Sometimes you might have to read a portion of Scripture to them. Sometimes you just might have to take them out and buy them a hamburger and just get their mind off of it. But by comforting people. That's practicing Christian love. Don't tell me you love Jesus. Show me you love Jesus. Practice it. We're responsible to personally study the Bible. The only Bible you get when you come to church, you're a very weak Christian. We're to study the Bible. Read it daily and study it. Get a topic you want to learn more on and start researching the fire out of it. Here's a good way to study your Bible. Just do a word study. Just pick a word. I want to learn about the fire of God. Well, get your good concordance and look up everywhere the fire is mentioned and just go read them, every verse, and start studying what God says about the fire of God or the love of God or the mercy of God. Just do a word study. You'll be amazed at how much you'll grow in the Lord just doing a word study. Just You're personally responsible to study your Bible. 
You know why? You're going to be judged by every word out of this book. You're not going to be judged by every word that Brother Doug said about the book. You're going to be judged by the book. So you need to study your Bible to make sure you're living the way the Holy Ghost wants you to live. And I say this, uh, we are responsible and obligated uh, to participate in faithful attendance. If you're a member of a local church, you're supposed to be there. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, so much more as we see the day approaching. What day? The Lord coming. He's coming. We're supposed to be here. Unless you're sick or providentially hindered, you're to be at the house of God. I wondered, how's your attendance? Are you faithful? I'm glad for the Wednesday night crowd. Most of the time they are faithful. Thank God for faithful folks. Well, when I when I was a young man, when I was lost, or even after I got saved when I was a young man, there were folks that were faithful to the house of God. That taught me some things. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. They were at the house of God. They were faithful. And that's a blessing. And can I say this? We're obligated to provide for the support of the church. We taught on that last week. The tithes and offerings of the church. As a member of the church, you are obligated to participate in that. You've got to provide for the funding of the church. Yeah, aren't you glad we've got a crowd that realizes the preacher don't get all the money? Hmm. Can I say something? Electric bills cost money. Security system costs money. Maintaining the parking lot costs money. Maintaining the building costs money. Huh? It all costs money. Sending money to missions, that costs money. Buying Bibles, so when you get a little girl visits like we did on Sunday, didn't even know what a Bible was, we could give her a Bible. Buying tracts costs money. It all costs money. But hallelujah, we've got folks that know how to give. I appreciate that. Can I say? You are obligated. It is expected from God for you and I to present ourselves blameless in our daily walk. We talked about that term blameless when we talked about uh, the qualifications of a preacher. That nothing can be thrown at him and stick. That ought to be your personal walk. Most people that are non-churched or most people that went to church and got hurt in church, they use this terminology. Well, I'm not going down there. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. You ever heard that term? A hypocrite somebody that says one thing and lives a different thing. Don't be that person. You ought to be what you say you are. Christian. Christ-like. Nothing should be able to stick on your life. People ought to say, well, I don't know about that crowd over there, but I know one person that stands for God, lives for God. I work with them. Go to school with them. I know that person. Your life, your daily walk ought to be blameless I've known people claim to be Christian their life didn't back it up that's a sad testimony let me say this as a Christian as a member of a local church we are obligated to promote the church you should tell everybody about your church you should pass out tracts and invite folks to your church you ought to constantly be promoting your church I know they get sick of hearing it, but maybe one day something will click and they'll come out. I read one time that, you know, most of the unchurched world will only come to church when they've had a tragedy in their life. A death, a divorce, a financial tragedy. Something disrupted their life and then they realize they need to go to church. And most of the time they go to the church that they've heard about the most or somebody's visited them the most. That's why you need to promote your church. Say, preacher, they just won't come. You don't know. There may be something coming around there in the corner of their life that, that's going to cause them to think about eternity. And if you've been telling them about your church and you've been telling them how much you love your church, they may just show up. That fellow showed up on, on Sunday morning and hadn't been in church in 25 years. And I don't know what happened in his life, but something's happened to make him want to come here not being in church 25 years need to promote the church uh, I'm not saying wear a neon sign everywhere you go but make certain when you let folks know where you go to church 
And when you're living right, that's a good thing. If you're living like the devil, don't tell them you come here. Tell them you go to vineyard, okay? All right. And then lastly, it's our obligation to prevent anything from dishonoring Christ or the church. You ought to never, ever get caught up in something that dishonors Christ or the church. Some people have never walked through our doors. The only Emmanuel Baptist Church they know is you. Some people have never read the Bible. The only Christ they know is what they've seen out of you. The Bible says this, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's being blameless. That's not giving anybody anything to dishonor Christ or the church. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Here's a good barometer to measure things by. If I get caught up doing this, is it going to bring shame on God or on the church? If the answer is yes, run from it. I'd abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Peter 2.11 Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Hallelujah, we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. We don't belong. He said, abstain from fleshly lusts, lust which war against the soul. There's something that your flesh craves that goes against your soul, goes against your spiritual man. He's warning us to abstain from them fleshly lusts. I have a hard time with Corvettes. I really do. Hmm. Me and Fiberglass got a good thing going. You know what I'm saying? But there is something you can be tempted by. So abstain from it. Shun it. Run from it. Don't feed it. And then I'll close with this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, verse 3. For this is the will of God even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor not in the lust of concumptuous even as the Gentiles which know not God that no man go beyond or defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testified for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We ought to just prevent anything from entering our lives that dishonors Christ or the church. He has made you and He's made us, according to Revelation chapter 1, I believe it's verse number 6, He's made us kings and priests in Christ Jesus. He's made you a priest that you don't have to go through anybody else to worship God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You can go directly through Jesus to get to the Father. You're, he's made you a priest. But He's also made you a king to rule and reign over your flesh. Uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the blood of Christ that has washed you, and through the Word of God, you can overcome anything. The bottom line is, you have two natures. The one you feed the most will be the strongest. You and I have obligations to the church. There is an order in the church. Thank God for the church. And as Baptists, we need uh, to embrace the goodness of God and the things of God and how He has dictated and directed them through the Scriptures so that we please God. It's a privilege to be a part of His church. And it's a privilege uh, to know Him. And how we treat him and how we treat the church testifies this world what we're really made of. And folks, we need to be real. If you need more instruction on your obligations to the church, the church covenant is a wonderful document. Uh, as a matter of fact, I understand Jordan taught on it not long ago in, in his Sunday school class, and they said he did a great job. Uh, listen. Living for God is not hard. The ways of a transgressor is hard. But in Christ, we've been set free. And we're free indeed. And I, I am not constrained anymore by sin and by the things of this world. I'm constrained by the love of God. 
And that love compels me to want to please him. Listen, 32 years ago, there were things I did that I, I, I just did because that was me. I was raised an only child. I thought the whole world evolved around me. But when I met that little brunette and married her, there are things I would have never done before, but I do them because I love her. Hmm? I make sure I pick up my socks out of the floor. I didn't do that for her. My mama did that. I didn't do that before. Huh? There are things I do because I love her. My love for her constrains me to not be me sometimes. Well, listen, as much as I love her and as much as she means in, in my life, Jesus did something far greater for me than she does. And my love for him constrains me to not want to be me, but to strive to be more like him. And I hope that's your desire tonight. Well, let's uh, stop there tonight. and uh, Brother Clint, once you get a song of invitation, maybe you want to just come and thank God for the church. Maybe you want to come and tell him you love him. Maybe he spoke to your heart. Maybe he told you not praying enough. Say, Lord, help me to spend more time in prayer. Maybe he told you something else tonight in the message. You just mind the Lord tonight. Let him have his way, all right? They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for the truths of the Bible. Lord, I know some of that stuff's sensitive. But, Lord, your word says it. That settles it. God, I'm thankful for the love of Christ which constraineth us. Now, Father, help these folks, help those that watch tonight, that we might all be beacons of your light, that many have come to Christ in these days. Bless as only you can. We'll thank you for it. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.